Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the SIREE Rotating Machines section webinar on linear electric machines for use in gravity energy storage systems. Before we start, a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on your device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. And by default, this control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of this webinar will be made available on the SIE YouTube channel, SIIEE TV. The registration link is in the chat box. Please click on that and register and you will receive notifications. But the recording of this webinar will be under the Rotating Machine section playlist. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few days after this webinar. I'd like to introduce you now to our host for today, Professor Jan de Kok, who is the past chairman of the SIE Rotating Machine section. And he's currently the SIE Deputy President and became an SIE member in 1986. He received his BEng, MEng, and PhD in Electrical Engineering from Stellenbosch University. He is a registered professional engineer in South Africa. Prof. Dr. Koch currently teaches power electronics, electrical machines, final year projects to undergraduate students, and advanced protection and power system dynamic courses to postgraduate students at Northwest University. Over to you, Prof. Dr. Koch. Thanks for the introduction, Minx. Ladies and gentlemen, from my side, welcome to this webinar, and I hope you're going to find it interesting. Um, today we have um, Moros Nyema um, from Stellenbosch University here. Um, he presented a paper at Southwick at the beginning of this year, which we found very interesting and very topical at this point in time, given the amount of load shedding that we have. And we thought it be interesting for everybody else also to hear what his research is about. So Morris received a beans from the University of Makarera in Uganda and then an image from the University in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia and currently he's working towards a PhD at Stellenbosch University where his research interest is in linear electrical machines and energy storage. Um, the topic of his talk today is on energy storage and then linear machines. And um, so because of the inherent intermittent nature of many of the renewable sources that we have, for example, wind and PV, there's often an imbalance between the energy generated and the energy consum consumed within a country. Um, these inherent problems in variable renewable energy sources can be mitigated with storage devices, for example, with batteries or pump storage. Um, Morris is going to present an alternative um, in the form of a linear electric machine based gravity energy storage system, which um, provides a lot faster response. Um, and will allow greater penetration of renewable sources into the grid. Morris, welcome to the RMS section of the Institute and to this webinar this afternoon, and we look forward to listening to you. Thank you very much, Professor Jan Diko, for the introduction. I hope everyone can see the, the presentation on your side. Uh, the presentation is about uh, linear electric machines for use in dry gravity energy storage systems. Uh, once again, I'm Morris Mujema, a PhD student at Stanley Moshe University with the Electrical Machines Laboratory. Morris, we're waiting to view your screen. There we go. Thank you. Yes, okay. Uh, let me go straight to the 
uh, the presentation outline here i'll look at the introduction and give a brief background of energy storage and why we need the energy storage and then i'll look at i will narrow down to the linear electric machine gravity energy storage system configuration explain the the system and how it works and then i look at the electromagnetic analysis of the specific machine after that we look at the control system for this uh, machine and then the simulation and system response for the for the specific application that we're going to look at and then we have a uh, conclusion apologies norris we've got quite a lot of background noise we can't really hear you clearly Ah, okay, sorry for that. Ah, all right, let me begin with the introduction. Uh, the renewable energy sources such as uh, wind and solar are increasingly growing, and this has been aided by the falling costs in the development of these technologies and also government policies that are encouraging a shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources. However, the, these renewable energy sources are creating non-uniformity in generation and that this is hindering the further penetration of these renewable energy sources on the grid. However, we know that these inherent natures of the, the renewable energy sources can be mitigated by coupling them with energy storage uh, facilities where the electrical energy can be stored in one form and then later on used by con converting it back to electrical energy from the different forms that it can be stored in and this also leads to great flexibility and reliability of the system uh, examples of these energy storage technologies are pumped hydro storage which is a, a well advanced uh, energy storage system we have a battery technology that is also well, growing very fast and in this uh, section we'll just be looking at the the prospect of a new and novel linear electric machine gravity energy storage system So in this figure one, we, we see the uh, classification of different uh, applications based on the power rating and discharge duration. Uh, the main focus in this will be on primary response, where we have a continuous correction of frequency and voltage fluctuations on the network. Uh, other applications of energy storage are energy arbitrage, where uh, electricity can be purchased during low price periods and then sold during high price periods. Uh, other examples are seasonal storage, which uh, entails uh, supply of power during long-term disruptions of, of power supply. And one of the examples here is the pumped hydro storage, which is well used for uh, seasonal storage which can give uh, a discharge durations of up to days or weeks. Uh, the most popular method for classification of energy storage technologies is by the form of the energy uh, stored. Uh, here we have five different classifications, that is mechanical, electrical, mechanical, electrical, electrochemical, chemical, thermal, and then electrical. Uh, for this particular presentation, we are concentrating on the linear electric machine gravity energy storage system, which uh, falls under the mechanical category. And in this case, we will be having, uh, we'll, I'll show you uh, where the where it falls under the mechanical category. And uh, that will be on the next slides. The linear electric machine in gravity energy storage system has been seen to be competitive with other energy storage technologies, especially when used in primary response applications, uh, that is frequency regulation. And other energy storage technologies that are used in primary response applications are uh, flywheel technology, 
we have the lithium ion battery, uh, vanadium redox flow batteries. All these are very competitive in providing primary response. And additional advantages of the linear electric machine gravity energy storage system as compared to the existing technologies is it has a high cyclability of over 5,000 annual cycle, uh, high power uh, due to the modular nature of the system, it can be able to be scaled to higher power and, and also has a longer life. The, one of the downsides of the linear electric machine is the high initial cost. Also, in addition to the, the, the construction time as compared to the battery technologies that are in existence. So to further uh, give uh, uh, much more information on primary response, uh, here on figure three, we see the impact of generation on, on the frequency of a system. So oh, as, as the frequency decays, here we have the arresting period, which is in, uh, less than 10 seconds. And we have a rebound period, which is between 10 to 20 seconds, and then the recovery period. So under primary response, <coughs> our systems are required at least to respond in less than uh, 10 seconds in order to capture this decay in the frequency. So this also forms one of the criteria of any energy storage system that should be used to provide uh, primary response services. So the system should be capable of responding in at least less than 10 seconds to, to capture the, the decay in frequency. So here I'm only showing the uh, frequency decay, but the system should be able to also handle uh, over frequency. So the next we look at the, the configuration of the linear electric machine gravity energy storage system. Uh, the system consists of a shaft. Uh, this can be an above ground or underground system. Uh, inside the shaft, we have the translator, which runs through the length of the system. And then we have a mover unit attached to a piston mass. And in this case, we have a 50 ton hexagonal uh, piston. Uh, a mechanical study was made for the different shapes and the hexagonal shape uh, it turned out to be, give a uh, best uh, mechanical strength. And then on each piston, we have a power converter, which connects to the grid. So for each uh, piston, we have six sides and each side has three mover units. So for a, a single piston, the total number of mover units are 18. And yeah, the potential energy stored at a given uh, height is, is given by uh, equation one. And this is in <coughs> megawatts, megawatt hour. And the main drive unit that we'll be discussing further is the consequent pole linear pannier hybrid machine that will be used as the main drive unit. So in figure five is a hexagonal piston and the shaft of a linear electric machine gravity energy storage system. So the, the required force and dimensions for a single uh, linear electric machine were determined, uh, the force is determined by equation two. So from here we determine the required force that the machine should have to, to drive uh, the, the piston. And then using equation three, we determine the dimensions of the of the piston mass. So the width of the piston, in this case, forms uh, or gives us the limitation of the, the stack length for the machine. And then the length of the piston also gives us the, the mover length or the length of the machine that will be attached to the, uh, the piston. So in this table, table one gives us the parameters. So we have a length, a maximum length of three meters. 
um, the width is one meter and the force determined was uh, 28 kilometers. So the linear machine design should, should be in position to provide 28 kilometers. And this is for a single machine. So for three machines on each side, that would give uh, 84 kilometers, an average of 84 kilometers to be able to drive uh, the piston mass. So this figure six shows the, the cross-section of the consequent pole linear vernier hybrid machine. Uh, one mover unit consists of two movers. And we have the translator, which is passive. Because when we look uh, at the cost of this machine, it's much cheaper to have a, a translator that is passive because this runs through the length of the machine, of the, of the shaft. And the, the mover, the movers have the, the amateur windings and the permanent magnets. Uh, this specific, specific machine operates on the magnetic bearing principle and thus is able to deliver very high at even low uh, speeds. For this specific machine, we have uh, two amateur uh, pole pairs and 20 uh, translator teeth, which gives us a gear ratio of, of 10. So this... Uh, Table two gives the, the design parameters of the machine. Uh, it's a three-phase machine, and the rated power per piston is 130, and the rated current is 376.8 amps. Uh, this is a low speed, so the rated speed is 0 0.25 meters per second, and the air gap considered was one meter or one millimeter. And so figure seven just shows the, the different uh, parameters for the for the machine that were used in the sizing. So we go to the electromagnetic analysis. We do a 2D finite element method that was uh, applied to determine the, the performance of the machine. And on figure eight, we see the flux linkage versus mover unit position for the constant pole uh, linear vernier hybrid machine. And as we can see, uh, a small displacement of, in this case, we had a translator pitch of around 43 millimeters as leading to a full, uh, a full or a complete electrical cycle of the flux linkage. So it's, it's on this principle that this machine is capable of uh, offering high thrust, even at, at very low speeds. And further on the electromagnetic analysis, uh, we do the, uh, the performance analysis in the, the DQ uh, reference frame. So here, figure nine uh, shows the DQ flux linkage and versus the mover unit position for the consequent uh, call. And on figure 10, uh, shows the obtained uh, average thrust force for the machine, and here we obtain 28.2 uh, kilonewtons, which is sufficient to move uh, the, the piston mass, and the force ripple of 9.98. The, uh, the force ripple can be further reduced by step positioning, although uh, in this presentation I, I don't go into the details of uh, force ripple reduction. However, it's 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 uh, in order to reduce the the vibrations on the system, considering that we have a, a high mass and high current on these machines, so it's always a a condition that is applied to uh, to reduce the force ripple and reduce the vibrations on the machine for better performance. So here we look at the control of the of the of the system. In this system, we use a cascaded speed and control unit. So we have a, a speed controller. Yeah. And then we have the current controller. 
which then feeds through the PWM inverter. And oh, then th there's a feedback for the current and also feedback for the position from the, uh, the piston mover. So this system is attached to the piston because for this specific design in the shaft, we can have uh, multiple pist uh, piston muscles corresponding to a given amount of power that the system can uh, deliver. So from the machine analysis, we determine the, 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 the machine parameters, that is the ID. So we're using the ID is equal to zero control technique. IQ is 376.8 amps. These are the inductances of the PM flux linkage, the resistance. And then this is the frequency. So these are the inputs that are used in the, during the, the, the design for the PI uh, controller for this machine. So the PI current controller design, the transfer function of the PI uh, series controller from the error signal to the control output is given by equation four. So here we have the KP and KI gains. So in the system, the, the uh, Q axis current controller acts on an error between the, the reference uh, signal and the measured signal. So from the PI controller, we, here we add the, the speed voltage here to determine the, the Q axis uh, uh, voltage. But then this is all uh, later on subtracted. So the system only acts on the, on the, the Q axis uh, constant polylinear value hybrid machine uh, DQ equivalent mode. So this is just added to determine the VQ, uh, voltage. This is the current uh, control system. So here we look at the, the PI speed controller. I figure 13 is the speed control system. So here we have the input speed reference through the PI uh, speed controller. And then from here we add the constant uh, gravitational load current because for this uh, specific system, Initially, we assume that the piston is uh, on the ground, but then to to start the the motion or the movement of the piston within the shaft, the piston needs to be moved to a given uh, uh, height or suspended. So there is always a constant gravitational load current applied to the to to the the machine. So from here, we also get the IQ reference. If you go through the Q uh, axis current control system that we saw before. And then this gives the, from there, this, the feedback here of the current was is given here in figure 12. Here, this is where we get the feedback for the uh, IQ uh, reference. And then this goes to the constant hold machine, which generates the force. And then the speed or the movement also now uh, form over here we form the, the feedback for this uh, speed because we are giving an input reference. So we determine the speed from the machine and then control the speed based on the actual uh, speed the machine is moving on. Uh, equation five here uh, shows the relationship between the current and speed controller bandwidth. So this, uh, the control system was narrowed down to tuning the, the damping factor, which is the delta here, and, and the bandwidth of the speed controller. So by controlling this and the, and, the, and the delta here, which is the damping factor, we can also determine the bandwidth of the, the current controller. So in this instance, the only two parameters that are tuned are the damping factor and the uh, bandwidth of the speed controller. Uh, this, the, the damping factor ensures that we have a, a good or smooth uh, current uh, response and also speed response.
So when we look at the simulation and the system response, our figure 14 shows the speed response during the charging and discharging. So initially when it, between zero to six seconds, the system is at ground, so the speed input is zero. This is speed uh, signal input is zero. Then at six seconds, uh, a speed reference uh, reference speed signal of zero point two five is given to the machine, and then this starts the charging process. So the blue graph here shows the speed uh, reference, and then the red graph shows this actual speed that the the piston is moving. At. So we can see during the charging, obviously here there's a slight overshoot, but then it settles in less than uh, two seconds and follows the the speed reference uh, blue curve uh, nicely. So this at six seconds here we get the charging, and then at at around fourteen seconds here it shows the discharging uh, cycle. And then figure 15, which is in relation to figure 14, is the current res uh, response based on the speed response. So we see at six seconds where we give the the speed uh, signal to start charging. Here there is a slight uh, increase in current or an overshoot. And then and during the tuning for the uh, the delta. For this, for the machine, for for this uh, controller, we ensure that the current overshoot is at least limited below uh, uh, fifteen percent. So you can get a faster response or a quicker response, but the faster the response, the higher the current overshoot. So it's it's more like a, a balance between a fast response and also uh, the current overshoot. So the selection of the, the delta and the bandwidth for the speed uh, controller is is selected to ensure that you have a reasonable response. At the same time, you also have uh, you don't get uh, an overshoot in current. So this is during the charging cycle. It is at this point, and then the uh, the system accelerates. So to decelerate, there's a small decrease in current. Then it decelerates then settles and then during the discharging period so it's at this point which is 14 seconds we also have a small decrease in in current and then settles so before we saw the, the speed and current response this one shows the the, the power versus the time. So we see initially here there is there's power that is drawn, and this is now to because we say initially the the piston is at uh, ground level. So to levitate the system, there's initial power that is drawn, and this is this spike here. So around 130 kilowatts, and then. As we saw before, the gravitational load current that we needed to keep the, the piston mass at a given position. So this shows that there's power being drawn to keep the piston at a given uh, a level. And then at this point, when a signal for it, when the charge is, is, is sent, we see that the system is is able to absorb uh, around 130 uh, kilowatts and then during the discharge cycle which is at this point uh, the system is discharges around 118 kilowatts of power uh, here this doesn't show the, the the response here is more of the system is settling so the actual charging or response time would be between here from when it starts to, to rise and when it's when it actually settles at the given power so from this we can see that the system can respond 
in actually less than uh, two seconds. And as we saw before, the, for primary response, the system should be able to absorb power or deliver power uh, within uh, in less than 10 seconds. If it is. So that is one of like, the criteria for, the, for any system that has to be used for primary response. Okay, so in, in conclusion, we see that the constant for linear vernier hybrid machine design offers a rigid structure, high thrust force, and good performance as a, the main drive unit in linear electric machine gravity energy storage systems. And for a smooth uh, speed response and uh, a low percentage current overshoot, the spe specific system, we had a tuning uh, damping factor of 10 and a speed bandwidth of 20 uh, radians per second. And from these simulations, we see that the system is able to respond in, in less than two seconds from zero to full power charging. And the same response is also achieved during the discharging cycle. Uh, this fast response of the piston is particularly good for the frequency stability, which is one of the criteria of uh, any system that has to be used for uh, primary response. Okay, uh, thank you very much for listening in and I hope you enjoyed that. Morris, thank you very much. Um, you're all encouraged to ask questions in the chat box. Um, the first question comes from Hannes van Jeden and he asks, um, if any of these systems have already been built, and if so, are they commercially used, and on what scale? Morris? Uh, this, uh, this system hasn't been built, uh, but it's, it's a project that I'm working on, and uh, hopefully by next year we'll have a, a prototype of, of showing the, how uh, this technology can be applied uh, in, on the grid. So it's still under, it's on a conceptual stage, I would say. So it's not yet uh, in application. Morris, then a question from me. Um, what is the overall efficiency of such a system? Uh, for, the, for this specific system, uh, the if, okay, the determined efficiency is uh, 91%, that is, charge and discharge efficiency for the system and that's very high morris yeah so if you're looking at an overall round trip efficiency because 91 percent is charging and then 91 percent discharging so overall uh, round trip efficiency would be around uh, 81. okay that Eight makes it compatible with pump storage which is somewhere between or in the mid 70s and very similar to batteries as well yes um, yes it, it's within the same range morris why do you think um frequency response such a fast response to load changes is important Uh, the, the response, okay, currently, okay, previously, uh, primary response was more of an inherent, uh, uh, I would say, system in the in, in the generators with the automatic governor controls. But as we move more into inverter-based generators, uh, we are we are losing more of this uh, grid strength or inertia from the system. So this primary response is more of shifting from being an inherent uh, system for the current generators and being uh, an independent uh, system. So it's much clear that because of the, uh, the increase in inverter-based generation, uh, primary response is becoming a critical uh, thing, especially with uh, changes in the, the renewable energies coming in. So to have uh, a primary response 
uh, categorized separately would mean we need systems that would provide for primary response. That is in, in events of either over frequency or under frequency. And because of these uh, generations being very intermittent, meaning there's, there are changes in, in the generation as compared to the, the load, or sometimes you have an over generation compared to the load, that means you need systems that are able to capture those frequent changes in frequency to either over generation or under generation. So this is a very critical area. Morris, um, what other technologies fall into the primary response category and how does your proposed system um, compare to other technologies in the primary response area? Uh, other technologies we have uh, the batteries also batteries are uh, uh, can be used in in the system however one of the 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 low side of the batteries is we're looking at maybe the cyclability or how many charge and discharge cycles that can be extracted from batteries so when we look at this system if it's a continuous system on an annual basis averagely the same that a system should have at least 5,000 to 10,000, should be able to provide 5,000 to 10,000 cycles. For the battery technologies with that high level of uh, cyclability means the lifetime of the batteries is, is very short. So when you look at the overall cost of the system in a long term period, it becomes more expensive. And then this system now, kind of offers that long-term uh, supply at a lower cost. Do you have any idea of cost, Morris? Yes, there's a, a, a cost study that is a levelized cost of storage study that uh, has been carried out, comparing the different systems for primary response. So for batteries, batteries uh, are currently at around 206, US dollars per megawatt hour. Uh, the current system that is looked at for the gravity system at a thousand uh, meters uh, gives around 143 US uh, dollars per megawatt hour. And that is for the levelized cost of storage. So this is a very uh, competitive, I would say, technology. The other competitive one is the flywheels, though they also have uh, the limitations in terms of uh, power that they can uh, deliver and the, the the time in terms of discharge so they have a limitation in terms uh, in time of discharge for their competitive that is the flywheel and then the batteries also have a low life which makes them more costly in the long run now that's where the system comes in to offer those uh, the long term a higher discharge period and a lower cost in terms of primary response. Thank you, Morris. A, a question from um, Lesedi. Um, you see, I saw um, the, the current that your system is drawing is close to 360 amps. And he was wanting to know what you are using as a power supply. I presume he's referring to your demonstration model. Can I come again on that? I didn't get the question. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the question centers around the load current or the charging current. And um, the city would like to know what you are using for your power supply. What technology are you using to supply such a high current? Oh, this this was done based on we're using a, a P, pwm uh, inverter to supply that is the converter is between the the machine and the grid and, you, and you're using igbt technology in this in this application uh, yes okay uh, Jan, I can maybe also come in here. Please go ahead, Martin. Uh, yeah, just give further feedback on the supply. Uh, 
the the shaft will have a DC supply. So it's a DC supply, uh, and you will get that uh, from moving moving the piston up and down, getting this a DC supply, and then the DC on top of the shaft. You will then have a, a DC to AC converter that links it to the uh, to the transformer, uh, uh, which then step it up to the grid. So, and that is bidirectional, so for charging and discharging. So this is how this is uh, basically working uh, in terms of the supply. Uh, so it's a fixed DC supply from top to down and uh, then one inverter uh, above and then all the pistons because there are many pistons with their own inverter getting the dc supply from the dc uh, cables okay thanks martin uh, another question from Anus van Heerden. um what sort of power range do you anticipate um these linear motors can operate in and he's, he's asking whether it is in the range of 150 or 100 megawatts oh yes thank you uh, this this is the system is, is scalable up to a megawatt range and is there a limit on on the the height that you can apply? Yes, currently we have looked at 100 meter height, which is above ground, and 1,000 meter height uh, for underground systems. So I think for, for above ground systems, there's a limitation in terms of height. Uh, that is up to 100 meters that is 100 meter uh, for the the discharge height and then there will be extra uh, a height of up to around 40 meters for for a system of with 10 pistons however for the underground system uh, it can go up even more than uh, a thousand meters but the above ground system is is limited Then there's a question from Dumile, and he's asking, why is this research relevant to South Africa, the African or in, in Africa as a energy storage requirement? What one would argue the world is moving um, to decentralized energy systems. Why should the system still be relative or relevant in the long term? And he says, thank you for your presentation. You found it very interesting. Yeah, so in particular, as you saw from my introduction, it's it's more of renewable energies and how best we can integrate them. So this, as, as we even go for the decentralized uh, uh, generation, Still, there will be if that generation is in form of renewable generation, there will definitely be need for energy storage to be able to uh, ensure a a flexible, I would say, flexible and reliable uh, network across Africa. Morris, do you think that synthetic inertia in other renewable energy technologies um, is going to be successful. I'll come again on that. I'm asking whether you think that synthetic inertia used in PV and in wind farms um, will be successful and compete with your technology. Uh, no, I can't, I can't confidently say uh, yes, uh, no. On that specific question, yeah. yeah. It's perhaps more a question for Professor Kamper. 
Yes, I know that you can also have virtual inertia from from the PV and wind systems, but I think it's limited also in duration and the amount that you can have. Uh, I'm also not an expert on, on on know very much on the what what in what amount of storage inertia you have. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that is all what I can say. This thing is substantial. Uh, uh, storage energy that you have, which I don't think the the PV systems have, and and furthermore, uh, you have this. Uh, if you don't have uh, obvious the PV and, and wind available, uh, then this is still uh, power that is stored that that you can use. So yeah, that is my feedback. Um, and then I, Jan, I would like to comment also on the previous questions, if I'm okay, um, uh, on the uh, on this whole system, why, uh, and for Africa and so on. You must imagine that uh, if you build such a system, it is like building a power station. Uh, it is a long term, 100 years, where these pistons can move up and down and you can use this. Uh, so it is a, a big thing. If you have 100 meter height, it can be as big as a rugby field of these shafts, and you have huge uh, megawatt hour storage then that you can use. Uh, it is also dry, so it doesn't need water or any fluid like in batteries. It's a dry system, uh, which fits very well with, with uh, South Africa or for Africa. Uh, so that was the focus of this of this research. Thanks. Thanks, Martin. Um, then a question from Gerard. He says, thank you very much for your presentation. I would like to know, are there any other energy sources that can be used uh, for the charge cycle other than the grid? Morris, can you answer? Oh, uh, can you can you repeat that question? Uh, Jared would like to know if you could use other energy um, sources other than the grid during your charging cycle. Yeah, uh, yeah this we are looking at uh, the the charging being from. It can either be from fossil fuel uh, generation or uh, any other type of generation. But in this specific study, we're only focusing on the charge being from renewable energy uh, sources. So the charge can come from any other source, though specifically the focus now here is on renewable energy sources. It is wind, uh, solar, that can be used to charge a system. Thank you, Morris. Um, then another question from the city. What is limiting your speed response from being better than two seconds? I know it's related to your current bandwidth. So if we consider current bandwidth, what is your limitation? In other words, can uh, your system, for example, respond in one second or half a second. Uh, yes, here the limitation was the, on the on the peak current that the system can handle. So the the limitation is is based on also how much of that overshoot or over current that will run through the system with a much higher response. So here we limited it to to about 13% uh, of the maximum power that, that the system can handle. So in this case, for this specific uh, uh, simulations, we ran at the boundary. So it came to around 1.7 seconds, but that is the minimum uh, response time that can be achieved when you set that limitation for how much overshoot current 
system can can handle. So in this case, uh, we can the minimum, or we can go with with this one was around 1.7, so just under two seconds. Okay. I can also comment further, uh, uh, Professor Jan. Um, yeah, it depends on your converter rating because with the piston active, you always have to keep a fixed current to to lift, uh, keep the piston lifted. So that, uh, and above that current, you need to accelerate uh, specifically for charging. And uh, yeah, if you have a big converter, you can really put a high amount of current for faster acceleration. But uh, that goes against the cost of the converter. So uh, it is there again uh, uh, against cost. You know, if you want to have such fast times, that you need a, a bigger converter. Thanks. Thanks, Martin. Um, a question from Emil Ingelbrecht, and he asks: Can the weight fall at a variable speed? And maintain the same output. Well, let's take the, them in two parts. First of all, can you vary the speed, or what does it take to vary the output? Oh yes, uh, the speed the speed can also be varied, but varying the speed also affects uh, the the overall efficiency. But now for the 100 meter system. Obviously, the, the 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 height or distance through which the, the system moves is already limited. So the peak speeds that you can obtain within a short distance is also uh, limited. However, for the a thousand meter systems, yes, the system can uh, run at uh, higher speeds for for the longer systems and also provide even uh, higher efficiency. Would you then, for example, be a, um, as a control parameter, um, have an input of the system frequency so that you don't overcompensate? Yes, on the on the control system, yeah. Okay, so you would be able to see as soon as the frequency is starting to recover that you could turn back um, the amount of power that you are generating at that moment yeah yes yes because this is it would be yeah it is by direction so you can do that okay. then a question from walter this is what are the cooling requirements of the system and if so how is this affected yeah so this uh, for the design we designed the system for it's more of air cooled, so the, the the design in terms of the the uh, electrical loading and uh, uh, the magnetic loading is to ensure that we have a, a cooling. Uh, it is air cooled, say. so this is an air cooled system. Yeah, I can also comment there that uh, the piston is open, so it's open in air and. The piston itself can absorb, uh, radiate the energy away. So, uh, yeah, that is another question to see how thermal we can do. But with an open shaft uh, and per piston, it, it looks to be not a particular uh, issue. If you may have in the shaft a bit of airflow, then more than more than uh enough uh but yeah this is still that one must investigate on the thermal side but at the moment we keep the current density quite low uh which uh to to make sure that the uh that it's acceptable the the current densities and losses in the machine thanks okay um perhaps two more questions um a quick, another question from Walter. Um, what would you characterize um, this technology as, for example, hydrogen generation would be green energy, 
would this be brown or black or green energy? Uh, this would fall under green energy. Okay. And then a last question from again from Lacetti. Um, any comment on the torque response of the system? Okay. Anyway, here we it's a linear machine, so we are we are looking at force. I would say. Uh, in this case, like I, I was I was showing initially, the uh, the system already has when it's already levitating or above ground, there's already uh, a force on the system already before it starts to to charge. So the the response I would say is almost is the same response in terms of the speed of so giving the signal already there is a force on the system. So the response is the same in terms of uh, the force required to move the, the system. Okay. His question was focused on torque and not on force, um, Morris. You asked me about torque response, not force response. Yeah, I can comment maybe. Uh, this is not torque, it's a linear machine, so it's not uh, a torque like in a rotational machine. So it's a linear machine, so it's uh, we we have to, at least in terms of forces, so a force response in this case then, right? Thanks for the clarity, Martin. I think with this, let's wrap up the session. It was scheduled for an hour. so. Morris, thank you very much for an interesting and thought-provoking presentation. And Martin, for your contribution as well. Over to you, Minx. Uh, thank you, Prof. De Kok. Thank you, um, uh, Morris and Prof. Kamper for joining us today. Thank you to the attendees. I know that load shedding does affect our attendance and you'd like to listen to webinars, but please, if you find in the chat box, the Registration link to SRIEE TV, so you will not be able, to, you won't be able to miss out on any uploads. But thank you for joining us. Have a good evening. Goodbye. <laughs>